So, uh, and these our letters shall be your sufficient warrant and discharge in that behalf. With these words, Queen Elizabeth executed a privy seal warrant on June 26, 1586, to give a large sum of money to Edward de Vere, the 70th Earl of Oxford. Now, my point of departure is that it is well understood that William Shakespeare, whoever he was, was an invisible man. And I want to thank Peter Dixon for his excellent talk yesterday, where he delved into some of the, these things, of this invisibility problem, which, which is well known and understood even by the uh, Orthodox. Uh, I yet like this quote from Dr. Michael Hart uh, when he talks about the uh, authorship problem. A, relation, a related problem is the fact that during his years in London, the great playwright was virtually invisible. My favorite quote is from Bill Bryson, the humorist, uh, who's trying to make light of it, saying, Shakespeare is the literary equivalent of an electron. Forever there and not there. Uh, is there any reason for this cloak of invisibility, which seems to be pretty well understood. Um, this I am offering to you is our purloined letter, something that is hiding in place, the document hiding in plain sight. And how many of you have read this? We have some people I've noticed very happy to see new hands of people who haven't been to a conference before. So those of you who might be a little bit newer to, the, to this Oxfordian thing may or may not have yet uh, read this document. How many of you have read it? Okay, a good many of you. All right, good. So we, we can read the words and know what they say. What I'm going to try to do today is for us to explore a little bit more deeply what it might mean. And I think that I will try to convince you, well, I know I will try to convince you, whether you're convinced or not, it's up to you, but that this document is serving as a cloaking device, explaining this invisibility problem. Now, a privy seal warrant was Queen Elizabeth's order to her exchequer to pay a bill or an expense from her royal administration. Most privy seal warrants were for a single sum of money to be paid at a single time for a single thing, and that was it. This particular document is unusual in that it is a privy seal warrant dormant. That meant that the money was supposed to roll on and on and on until the, the queen or the monarch gave another uh, order to stop it. In this case, it ran for 18 years, 17 years during the reign of Elizabeth to the rest of her life, which was the rest of her reign. And then it was, it was reissued by King James for another year and went on and then stopped upon the death of Edward de Vere in 1604. So we have 18 years that this money rolled out of the royal exchequer. Um, it contains a provision clause and a non-accountability clause that we will be looking at very closely soon. Uh, first thing, a few things though, the history of this document is interesting. John Thomas Loney did not know about it when he wrote, when he proposed Edward de Vere as Shakespeare in his Shakespeare Identified in 1920. It was discovered by and presented to the world by Bernard Ward eight years later in 1928 in his biography of the 70th Earl of Oxford. And I had bought a few copies of photo copies and several of you already have them. So, uh, and by the way, if you want another, if you do happen to want a copy of this book, because I'm going to be uh, referencing it several times and you don't have it, give a donation to the research grant program and Alec or, or, or Tom will let me know that that has come and I will be glad to give you that as a gift. Because this is an important book and very significant to our, to our subject here. Um, before that time, though, before uh, 1928, it had only been commented upon one single time by a historian in the 17th century. Now, a few things to consider. Elizabeth's exchequer was an all-cash operation. She did not pay, the exchequer did not pay money for their bills, did not release either the gold coin or gold or silver coin or bullion or gold coin or bu silver or bullion, uh, gold or silver, until that it, the money that, that was in hand. What a novel idea. <laughs> um, I like to quote Lawrence Stone because he's a leading historian of the time, and he also has a nice, succinct way with words. And, but because he's a leading historian, he's got the facts and information in, this book to, in his books to back it up. So I'm quoting him for this. Money was one thing that Queen Elizabeth could not bring herself to give away. 
few more things to consider. There was no purpose given in, in the document for this annuity. In his chapter, Maintenance for His Nobility, Alan Nelson his, <laughs> puts forth in his monstrous book that uh, he, he believes that this money was given to Oxford to support him because he was impoverished. And of course, we know Elizabeth had a sudden attack of generosity. Uh, it, is, it is only historical notice, which was by Edmund Bohun in 1693. Um, Bohun notes that, uh, has this to say, that Queen Elizabeth gave this money to Oxford, quote, so that one of the most illustrious houses in her kingdom might not suffer want. And I'm sure that before he was executed, the, Earl, the Duke of Norfolk would have been glad to know that she did not want an illustrious house to suffer want. But a few more things. Lawrence Stone also has established that it took about 5,000 pounds a year to provide and keep an earl in an earldom. So although 1,000 pounds a year, which is what's given in this annuity, is an enormous amount of money to be get, pay, paid out in gold in her exchequer, it was still not enough to support an earl and an earldom if keeping up appearances was what it was all about. But there's a more serious problem with the keeping up appearances argument. The problem is, is that this is not the way the queen did business. What she gave were preferments and monopolies and sinecures. Again, quote, quoting Stone with his nice turn of the phrase, the queen gave that which cost her nothing. Uh, this has been well established by historians, an early historian in, in writing in 1914, early in the 20th century, oops, um, had this to say, and I'm just to, to further support that this is a stand, this is well understood by historians and for a long time. Elizabeth's grants rarely took the form of ready money or direct gifts, an appointment to an office, a promotion to a more lucrative office, the reversion of an office, an antiquated sinecure, a grant of confiscated lands, a monopoly of the licensing of some article for import. Such made up the treasury from which the queen rewarded her courtiers and to which they looked with constant eagerness. And so did Edward de Vere. Edward de Vere petitioned at one time or another for all of these particular items. He wanted to be the gauger of vessels for beer and ale. Now, beer was a very major export from England, and in, any one of these could have made him a very, very wealthy man. He wanted the monopoly on wools, fruits, and oils. Wools was, was another major export and major source of income into England. Uh, he, wanted, he tried for the monopoly on Cornish tin. That's the tin mines in Cornwall. Uh, and they were very lucrative up into the 20th century, a very important commodity. Uh, he tried for two sinecures. He wanted the governorship of the Isle of Jersey, and he tried for the present Sea of Wales. He also tried for the recovery of what had been, I call it his lands, but had been lands in the Oxford earldom uh, that had gone to the, ro that, uh, the royal, uh, royals had taken over in the middle of the century before in Waltham Forest, and the queen denied them all. There is no purpose that we know for this, uh, given for this, and nothing uh, that Edward de Vere did that could possibly have earned, for which he could have earned this money. He held no state office. He was never the Lord Treasurer or the Lord Lieutenant of something or another. Uh, he held no embassy position and no military post. Now, he did occasionally um, have an occasional military stint, but nothing of the duration or import to be commensurate with this kind of money. Uh, very significant. However, the Queen did provide for him when she allowed him to marry Elizabeth Trentham in 1592, approximately three and a half years after his first wife, Anne Cecil, had died. Uh, Elizabeth Trentham was a maid of honor, and we've been hearing about her in earlier talk. Um, of Elizabeth, she was one of Elizabeth's maid of honor, and Elizabeth was pretty stingy when she allowed her maids of honor to get married. But she did, in this case, with apparently no protest at all. Uh, Trentham was, came, was a wealthy heiress, and with this marriage, the 70th Earl of Oxford was provided for in an acceptable way by the standards of the time. Again, turning to Lawrence Stone, Around the turn of the century, the growing embarrassment, and he means, of course, financial embarrassment, of the peerage, Ed Edward Vere was not the only one who had financial woes. Uh, this um, growing embarrassment of the peerage drove them into a far more single-minded pursuit of wealthy marriages than had previously been their custom. 
Another thing to bear in mind, Edward de Vere is generally referred to by historians as feckless. I looked up what feckless means. That means these things. Incompetent, useless, spineless, feeble, ineffective, worthless, aimless, futile, and irresponsible. To which one historian piles on unreliable, uncontrollable, ill-tempered, and wildly extravagant. And another says he was eccentric, quarrelsome, and absurd. I hope it's right that there's no such thing as bad publicity. <laughs> when the annuity began in 1586, this is the last thing to bear in mind. The Queen's Exchequer was impoverished by wars on three fronts. The Queen was at war with Spain all over the place on the high seas. She was at war actually with Spain in the Low Countries, what we call the Netherlands now, and Ireland was a constant problem. Yet these wars and this annuity continued for the rest of her reign. Now I want to delve a little more deeply into this for you, for you to realize, and as I was trying to realize how very serious this problem of the wars it happened to be and what it did to her exchequer. I'm using, um, I like to source things so that if you want to know where this information comes from and, and, and check, it, check it out and see what more they have to say, uh, this, com this comes from Black's Reign of Elizabeth. Uh, open hostilities with Spain began in 1585. After 1587, the Queen's finances worsened. By 1593, Parliament had allocated 280,000 pounds for the wars, but the Queen had spent over a million pounds. By 1597, the Queen was selling crown lands to fund the wars. And this was a very serious problem to the Queen and her exchequer to be selling the crown lands. That was her very last uh, step. Uh, in the acrimonious Parliament of 1601, she called for more subsidies to finance the costly mess. The bad harvest of 59 has worsened the plight of the poor uh, who were compelled to sell their pots and pans to meet the already heavy burdens of taxation. A little more closely, I don't know how well this shows up in the back. Can y'all see it uh, from the book on the economic history of England? Uh, the total, this is just some interesting uh, Further information to support the total that the war's cost were under military expenditures. Does that show up pretty well? Okay. Uh, it was five million pounds. The Low Countries, she ended up by these, and this was from an early document uh, where they're trying to account for where the money went. Uh, for over a million four pounds from 1585 to 1597 in these totals. The conquest of Ireland cost nearly two million pounds in the last decade of the Queen's life, and actually over three million was spent during the decade from 1590 to 1600. Just a few facts and figures. Let's hone in now more on the year 1586 when Oxford's annuity actually began. And her, and her troubles were really beginning to pile up on her. Uh, in his chapter, The War Goes Sour, in uh, 1586 to 1587, historian Paul Hammer has this to say. And I've just picked a few quotes, but as I said, I recommend this book. It's really very, very interesting. Um, as the full magnitude of the financial shambles began to emerge during the early months of 1586, Elizabeth became increasingly angry and was having issues. Uh, England's war effort was in sorry shape by the end of 1586. Although Elizabeth was contractually bound to keep 126,000 a year on the war in the Low Countries, actually spending top to 150,000 pounds. She was just constantly getting deeper and deeper into the hole. Um, and the army was left destitute over the winter. What a fine time for her to be shelling out some money to a, to a feckless nobleman. Another interesting point I should have put up here is that during this time, her best general, who was General John Norris, was not getting paid. He was, he was her general in the, in the Low Countries. He was not getting paid. He didn't get paid and couldn't in turn pay his men there uh, for 10 years. So it, you know, th these things are really very serious issues. She's in a bind. So what is going on? When the miserly queen executes a privy seal warrant to give a lot of money from her struggling exchequer to a feckless nobleman for an indefinite length of time with no accountability, had she lost her mind? <laughs> what on earth? What might she have been thinking? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that we might be able to figure out, get some idea of what the Queen was thinking in the provision clause and the non-accountability clause in this document. 
First, we're going to look at the provision clause, which is right here. And so to be continued unto him during our pleasure or until such time as he shall be by us, otherwise provided for, to be in some manner relieved. Pretty clear. The queen is taking financial responsibility for Edward de Vere. Like, you can't read that any other way. It is puzzling because there's nothing in the world that could compel her and uh, to provide for him. Now, I know there are Prince Tudor theories out there, but she was a monarch and she could do what she wanted. She could, she could not be forced to do this. Um, and remember, she could have given him a, lu a lucrative preferment that would have cost her nothing. Let's take a little quick trip down memory lane. He had asked for all these things. So why didn't she give him one of them? I mean, she's, this is what she did. She didn't give it to him because a, lucre, a preferment did not, could not be freighted to carry the implication that this official document could carry. Indemnification. Let me explain to you. What, where my thought processes are in this. Uh, in modern legal practice, a person or an entity indemnifies another person or entity by taking fiscal responsibility for the actions of that person or entity, securing them against future loss, damage, or liability. I think she's doing this by accepting financial responsibility for him. And she couldn't do this by way of a preferment because that's what she ordinarily did. It wouldn't have the same power. Now let's look at the non-accountability clause. Uh, our further will and commandment is that neither the said Earl nor his assigns nor his or their, ex or their executors nor any of them shall by way of accounting press or any of the other way whatsoever be charged towards us, our heirs, our successors. Um, yes, this is broad brush and he is not to account for what he's doing with the money. However, Something I'm going to offer to you else is tacitly implied in this clause. As Edward de Vere is not to be held to account for what he is doing with the money, does this not tell the government authorities that he is not to be held to account for what he is doing? Period. From this, he has protection, the protection of the queen herself for whatever it was that he was doing, this is carrying the implication of immunity. It's almost like an early modern English version of a hold harmless and indemnify clause. It makes Edward de Vere's activities a, state, a secret of state, a state secret. Now, I do understand that the legal concepts of immunity and indemnification were not around in early modern England, but what was operational then was the concept of feudalism. The Tudors were completely consumed with feudalism and the feudalistic trans, uh, traditions, uh, in which a, po a powerful a monarch or lord would granted maintenance and protection in return for service. So what service was Edward de Vere providing? Well, it's so very nice that we can quote a justice of the United States Supreme Court, uh, who in a, really, in a follow-up article, I think that, was, that spurred his thinking on was the moot court that we were so uh, lucky to be able to see last night. That, that, that's one of the things that really put his got his interest into this. Uh, and he wrote in 1992 an article published in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review where he says it in no uncertain terms that the money was paid by the Queen to support Edward de Vere's theatrical activities, and the Shakespeare history plays supported the legitimacy of the Tudor dynasty. He draws that connection very clearly and, uh, and, and very well. Uh, it is also put forth with more detail and very well by Mark Anderson in his book, Shakespeare by Another Name. And as I was telling Mark back there at the end of the room, uh, had he been considered enough to write his book 15 or 20 years earlier, I'm sure the justice would have been quoting Mark. But this is what... <laughs> Uh, but what this, what he says here is, there's, there was a, a person. It's, it, this was not an, uh, uh, this was not an original thing with the justice, uh, Justice Stevens. There was an educator in the early part of the middle of the 20th century who said that the plays were intended to educate the English people, most of whom could not read, 
in their country's history in appreciation of its greatness and of their own stake in its welfare. The quote goes on to say that a spate of Shakespeare's chronicle plays did follow the authorization of the stipend. Uh, Mark concludes and sums it up so well with this. The end product of the Queen's thousand pound annuity were Shakespeare's King John, Richard II, one, two, Henry IV, Henry V, one, two, three, Henry VI, Richard III, and Henry VIII. They were the culmination of a nuanced and sophisticated public relations campaign. Yes, quite a worthy service to provide to an insecure Tudor woman who ruled a vulnerable country in a dangerous time with three ongoing wars. Now, we're going to go back to the non-accountability clause. Yes, oh, oops, okay. And I, I'm going to be quiet for a minute, and I want each of you to read it. And there's one word in here, and those of you who, who heard my talk at, uh, in Los Angeles, you can't, you don't count, you can't say this, but I want, there's a, something in this that has bothered me, because I've worked on this off and on for a lot of years, tried to rationalize it, tried to, something, something bothered me, it just didn't feel right, and I want to know if anybody wants to hazard a guess as to what the word is on my next slide. And I'll give you a hint, it's one of the words in red. Good. What? That's good too. Those are actually very important keywords. Anybody? Yes. Oh, what? Good. It's not on the next slide, but but it's actually a very important word in this. What? What? <laughs> what? Us? The. the. Oh, the. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What? Yes. Oh, very good. Actually, y'all are all close. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're all closing in on it, but actually, I'm get, okay, the word is us. That bothered me. The reason is it shouldn't be charged toward us, it should be charged toward him. It, okay, uh, now, I do know that with the pronoun us, she's referring, and this is very important, of course, she is referring to her royal administration, not the kingly we, our, yeah. She's not referring to herself pers personally, certainly not. Okay, now, the name of this, from here on out, we're going to do, the name of this segment of my talk is called Come, Let Us Reason Together. Okay. <laughs> okay. Taken literally, and I've been going through this reasoning process for quite some time here, uh, the queen appears to be saying that the recipient, the earl, can't charge toward us. Uh, the recipient can't charge the royal exchequer with accounting for the funds. Of course, this is nonsense because this cannot possibly be what she is saying or even implying. The recipient of funds accounts for how the money allocated to him is spent, not the entity providing the funds. Um, then after I presented this in Los Angeles in January, I had some questions along these lines. And this, this is what I started me to, so I, the wheels started to turn so to, to address these questions a little bit better. I had been working on them, but I wanted to find out more along these lines. What was the usual verbiage for a privy seal warrant with a non-accountability clause? Were similar warrants issued? Does a comparable document exist? And I knew that I needed to continue to, to delve deeper into the language of non-accountability clauses and to learn more about the Elizabethan exchequer. Now, uh, Bernard Ward, in his History of England, had actually quoted from Cheney's history, excuse me, Bernard Ward in his, in his biography had quoted from Cheney's History of England, which was the operational history at the time, published in 1914. And uh, th this history, this early history, had said, considerable sums of Secret Service money were put in the hands of Secretary Walsingham, quote, and it is pretty clear they are quoting from the Privy Seal Warrant, to be by him employed in such causes of Her Majesty's service as are appointed him without charge or any account to be laid upon him for the same. But I wanted to know more. That wasn't good enough. So I went back into Ward's book. And as I said, Ward's book is a very helpful book. This is the only place I have found this information. In the appendix, Ward has listed what appears to be a comprehensive list of all of the privy seal warrants entered by the, given by the Queen from uh, 1580 to 1603. Um, however, they're not all actually previously warrants dormant. Some of them are 
are uh, ordinary with an O here. I don't know if you can see that. And some are G with for gratuity. So actually, of the 27 entries, only 17 of them are actually privy seal warrants dormant. And I was looking for as close and similar a document as I could find. Uh, this one really caught my eye because it is, I know you can't see this, it's to Robert Cecil and it's for secret service money. And I thought, well, since the, since the the money to Walsingham was for secret service money and that has a non-accountability clause, I was hopeful that this would have a non-accountability clause too. That's for the legal ones among you. That was my train of thought then. So Ward also very kindly provided where this document could be found. It was in series two, which is this up here, E, this information. And so with this information in hand, I contacted the National Archives. And a few days later, this is what they sent back. They responded that they could not find this document. They said that this document was, quote, not easily identifiable. It was possibly part of a larger document. And they hired, they suggested that I hire someone to search for it, which I did. Okay. There it is. Here is the not, oh, and she found it easily, by the way, but the not easily identifiable document up here, dormant, Sir Robert Cecil Knight, Principal Secretary to the Queen's Majesty. There it is. I was especially, I was so happy, I could hardly, I was, just could hardly contain myself, because this, by the way, is, the, is a copy of the Earl of Oxford's dormant. Warrant. So as you can see, they're almost same size type documents, look the same. You know, how, how, I mean, this is a dream. For a comparable document, this is a dream. Uh, it's, uh, they're both the same types of document. They have similar opening and closing verbiage. The monetary amounts are very similar. It is 800 pounds annually to Cecil and 1,000 pounds, of course, to Oxford. It is to be paid in quarterly installments, 200 pounds to Cecil, and of course we know 250 pounds per quarter to Oxford. And yes, my hope was rewarded. It does have a non-accountability clause. Uh, I won't keep you. In, I won't keep you in suspense for one more second. I tried. I. I tried my hand at, at the secretary hand to transcribe it and uh, well, there were a few words I was not sure of so I sent the document to Nina Green uh, who very graciously provided me with this transcript so I can be assured that it is perfect because it needs to be perfect because we're comparing language and I'm of course greatly in Nina's debt for sending me this uh, transcription of this document. Um, two things to call to your attention. First of all is it has a secrecy clause in it. It goes like this. Certain, to, she's giving to Robert Cecil from time to time, to disperse from time to time, certain sums of money for our private and inward services, which of our special trust we have made known to him only. Isn't that interesting? And then the amount of money and, and, and that it's to be uh, in quarterly installments. And then here we have it. Here is our non-accountability clause. The same to be delivered to him from time to time as he shall require it of you without impressed, that is an important word, account or other charge to be, to be set upon him for the same. Clears the bell. No problems. Um, there is a book, and you can get this book. On, it's, it's been digitized by Google. I love Google digitize books. So, uh, it was published in 1836. It is uh, it, by this individual, uh, Frederick Devon. Just put this in, and, and it'll pop right up, and you can read all of these hundreds of things. Uh, that uh, they they are transcriptions called Issues of Her Exchequer uh, of, of the Exchequer, but it is from the reign of James the First. Unfortunately, so far as I know, and I've really tried, there is no similar book of transcriptions of the Privy Seal warrants or Pell issues in the reign of Elizabeth. So we just don't have them. But it does begin, there are oh, about 100 entries with non-accountability clauses. And they do come more, more frequently as you get later and later in the reign of, of King James. But just to give you a few, I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to walk you through 100 of them. But, but every single one 
reads like this. Well, the first one is in 1603. He's giving to the Countess of Desmond and her three daughters without a, a account impressed or other charge to be set on them. Uh, this is to somebody without account impressed or in, uh, charge to be set on him for the same. Uh, you without and, and these words are very important. This is, this is the standard formula. Without account impressed or charge to be set on him for the same. Um, Interesting one down here. They, uh, as I said, I won't walk you even through all of these, but you you can see that it, it's always the set on him or her. It's got the pronoun right. Thank goodness. At any rate, uh, this one is interesting to Robert Cecil because this was given in October 26, 1607, for his special service services to be paid to his lordship. Again, you can't see the word there, but it's without account, impressed, or other charge to be set to be set on him. It doesn't show up there, but to be set on him for the same. Every single one of, a, of about 100 reads exactly that way. So what tells me is that this language was really very, very written in stone and, and very securely done, and they did it, and they stuck to their formula, and they didn't change it. So what is all of this charge towards us stuff happen to be about. I am suggesting to you that this is either ve it's very unusual and it might even be outright, downright unique. So something, I think because of that reason, it has some meaning. And now I'm going to try to explore what that meaning is. Oh, good, we have enough time. Okay. Uh, it, the, the next step is to figure out what its significance might be within the exchequer, because this is an order to her exchequer. Now, the, the uh, historian that I found who has the most um, insight into this is a, a now long forgotten historian named Frederick C. Dietz. He was a historian at the University of Illinois in the earlier part of the 20th century, and he has these four sources. The most helpful, of course, is this Exchequer in Elizabeth's Reign, published in Smith College Studies in History in 1923. Um, he does have three, three other sources. This, also published in Smith College in History in 1929, he talks about the reigns of James and Charles. And he does have good supplementary information, but of course this is by far and away. I, I hit some pay dirt on this. I was very happy about that. Then uh, he has a book called English Public Finance, which was published in 1932, but reprinted in 1964. So it's actually the most uh, easily accessible of his works. And then a book called Economic History of England in 1942. Um, I'm telling you that so that you can find these sources if you like and maybe go through it and, and glean from it more than I have. But these are what I think are the major points. Um, and, and they're significant to know, so I'm going to try to go through a few of them. But the most significant thing of all is that there were two houses of the exchequer. There was a lower exchequer of receipt and an upper exchequer of audit. The money, that gold or silver, coin or bullion, was actually received and dispersed in the lower exchequer of audit. Oh, excuse me, the lower exchequer of receipt. The upper exchequer is where the accounts were audited. The lower exchequer had four tellers who handled the money. There were several audit courts with their respective duties and administrators, including the barons, you refer to the barons of the exchequer, and the clerks, and their accountants, and their other auditors. A very important job was, Lord, was held by somebody who was called Lord Burley's Remembrancer. And at some point, he ordered accounts of the audit office to go through the pipe office to be enrolled in the great foreign roll. What I'm trying to get at here is you've got a lot of moving parts. <laughs> Lots of things people are reporting. This person is reporting that. They used a primitive tally system uh, for the tellers when they, uh, when they dispersed the money to report to the auditors in the upper house. Uh, it was very slipshod, and w William Cecil Lord Burley was always trying to get a hold of it because, to try to get a handle on it because, according to Dietz, Elizabethan exchequer officials were never quite as accurate as a modern adding machine, and there are discrepancies between the totals as they give them at the close of their accounts and the actual additions of the individual items making up that accounts. So there's a, many a slip twixt cup and lip on this thing. There were two auditors of the Queen's Prests, and this is surely has something to do with that, what that word impress is, m m means in that non account in those clauses. Uh, but the monarch, he or she, could supersede this mechanism and exert direct control over the press if he or she chose to do so. 
The Queen's Press auditors were a separate department from this Exchequer Upper House of Audit. So you've got another situation of auditing going on. And, however, according to Dietz, when Lord Burley was Lord Treasurer, he kept exclusive control over the press. I might say he might have had exclusive control, except for this, this might be the one exception to his, quote, exclusive control. Because we, we will never quite be able to see into the, how opaque this thing is as to exactly who was reporting to who and to, who this, uh, to whom this statement charged towards us is really supposed to, to go to. However, I would suggest to you that this man certainly knew what it meant. And what I think, somehow or another, in all these moving parts and inherit in this awkward, laconic, cryptic verbiage is an order to the various officials of her exchequer, to their tellers and their clerks and their messengers, and the various and sundry people who are in the loop to minimize their usual lines of communication and the reporting that they did back and forth in the normal uh, order of exchequer business. And that is what I think, if that is not too much of a leap. Somehow or another, in all of that reporting back and forth, this is being exempted, this annuity is being exempted from the standard accounting practices. Which reinforces and further supports that this thing is a secret of state. It's a state secret. She is putting, the queen is putting another, another layer of secrecy around Edward de Vere and whatever this monetary gift was all about. In with the confines of this very short document, this privy seal warrant, I'm suggesting to you that this provides us with a unifying explanation. Now, in Madison, Doctors, when a doctors have a patient comes in that has a lot of difficult symptoms and they can't quite figure out what's wrong with the patient, they search for the unifying explanation. And for those of you, I don't know if any of you are fans of the TV show House, like I am, it's a standard, typical episode when the patient comes in and has a lot of serious issues and somebody house team says, it's this and this, and oh no, so they treat and the patient gets worse, and it's this and this, and they treat that, and the patient gets worse, and finally... Dr. House strolls in, and because he is as brilliant as he is irascible, he comes up with a unifying explanation that it can explain these conflicting and contradictory and disparate symptoms. And then, of course, they treat, once they've got the diagnosis, they can treat the patient, and they save the patient's life, all a good thing. But I will show you, these, this is what would be on Dr. House's whiteboard as they are discussing this particular patient. Shakespeare is an invisible man. Edward Vere is supposedly a feckless wastrel. The queen is a parsimonious miser. The queen is impoverished by three wars. The queen gives a large monetary payments, large monetary payments, to go on and on and on for a definite length of time without requiring accountability. When her normal practice was to give performance, it costs her nothing. The queen then instructs her exchequer to look the other way as these funds are delivered and paid to the 70th Earl of Oxford. The unifying explanation is that the privy seal warrant dormant with this money as part of this official document. She's supporting Edward de Vere's theatrical activities and all the while mandating that it is to be a state secret. And that's a wrap. <laughs>